being the one with nature in the town uh, just brings up so many conflicts and dilemmas. It's just, it wasn't real, there's something not real about living in a concrete world where you walk from the, on tarmac, then concrete, then tarmac, and, you know, just unreal, just not right. And so we had to find ways of somehow being at one with nature because that was obviously had to be a part of the, the hippie philosophy, being one with nature. Hippies in those days, well, we used to have free festivals. They were organised by word of mouth. So for, for a hippie in, in one place to be able to, to, to communicate with a hippie in another place, basically you had to go to a free festival to do it. And, the, and so word of mouth spread about these are the free festivals. And in those days, they, they were, ended up as being hundreds every year. All around the country, local people would get a free festival and they'd basically, basically they'd squat a bit of land for a few days. And so at uh, the, the third Windsor Free Festival was violently broken up by the police but, but by then people were beginning to get a bit more sussed about what we needed to be doing with our lives. And so in 1975 basically a group of people uh, having just discovered the teepee and it was Chris Waite. He was the one who who introduced the teepee to the hippie movement. Well we probably had the first teepee on this island actually but uh, not that that matters really <laughs> just happens to be a coincidence. The first festival a teepee went up was a Stonehenge festival if you were going to go into the country to do a festival, you could only get your vehicle onto certain types of land. You can't go uphill in the wet, for instance, with the vehicle, or you get stuck in the mud or whatever. Whereas a teepee, you're actually able to live on the land and be comfortable and survive wherever you are. all the stuff you've seen is archive material and the reason why it's so a bit unique is I was the only person at the festivals to have a video camera. The cameras were not thought good things to have generally speaking on a festival site because it was all illegal. Your vehicles were illegal, everything was illegal. Of course the authorities immediately turn up going or the police or whoever come and say well we want to speak to the leader, we want to speak to who's in charge here, we want to speak to that because they come from a world where there's always somebody in charge of something. We come out of a war not so long before that so who's in charge? And everybody goes, well, I don't know, who's in charge? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not in charge. I don't know. And so they'd be stumbling around, you know, initially before they began to get the idea, stumbling around, uh, trying to find somebody in charge to talk to. I've been busted more than once for possession of very small quantities of cannabis. And in those days, uh, it was really harsh, the, the way they dealt with people. I spent six months inside prison for what was one joint, which wasn't even my joint. I was with a group of people who got passed round. I did six months for that. That's how it was in those days. And I, I, remem I remember when I was being carted down from Wormwood Scrubs in one of those prison buses, and we were being driven down, and we were driven through all these bland, horrible, estates of, of houses and I, re I remember uh, it was almost like a, a spiritual experience. I was handcuffed and, and uh, all I could see was through these bars and I looked out and I thought oh, that, how horrible it all was, how much I disbelieved in the, in the whole uh, civilization that could, could produce living like, like this. And I, I, I thought to myself those people are all prisoners in that society 
and and yet most of them they they've got no idea they're prisoners. I know I'm a prisoner. I'm a prisoner for the next six months. And I'm never going to live in, in one of those houses again. And I've never lived in a house again. I, uh, I was welcomed out by a bunch of hippies when I came out of prison. And I w was straight around on the, on the free festival circuit. I came out in April. And by the end of that summer, I was living in Teepee Valley. very book and I first saw it in here it's uh, hey, uh, yeah that page I mean apart from in films where you saw um, John Wayne going in and shooting our Indians that's the first time I saw a serious thing about how to make a TV and if you look here there's a thing how it's put up and here an actual plan of how you cut one out of strips of canvas sewn together. Sorry, three. Do you know what this is? You heard the story about curiosity and cats. Do you know what happens to curious cats, man? They get eaten by hungry hippies used as a food source. Come on, out the way, man. I need to do this trick. If you read about it, it's like warm and snug in the winter and cool in the summer. If you want the purest essence of life, if you're getting back into that, there isn't anywhere like that. Because, I mean, it, you're living outdoors, for, in, for a start. You're, living, it isn't, you're not indoors, you're living outdoors, around an open fire. What you're doing is living around an open fire. But you've managed to put this little cloak around you to protect you from everything. So you're living on the earth, round an open fire. And if you look at a teepee from the side, you'll see that it looks like a American Indian warrior sitting cross-legged on the ground with a blanket around him like that. It's exactly the same shape. It comes out at the front like that. He's got a headdress that goes up like that. 
He's got a pipe that goes up like the smoke flaps like that, and he's blowing pipe out. And in a way, you see, the, the fire is like the altar, is that central thing that draws your mind in and gives a focus. Okay, you, you've just uh, come from the big lodge where the, the form of heating and lighting is basically the great big fire in the middle of the teepee. Uh, my teepee is a bit different. I evolved it. First of all, when I started having kids, sometimes the teepee could be a bit smoky and it just didn't seem fair on the kids, so I wanted to get rid of the smoke. So I put a wood burning stove in the middle of my teepee. So here we've got a wood burning stove. And in here I've got a geodesic dome inside the teepee uh, and the geodesic dome uh, keeps the heat in and it also keeps the drips out so there's no drips and it stays warm it is a, a, work in, a work intensive way of life and rather than me working in an office to earn some money to pay the electricity board to run a power station uh, the same amount of time I go and, and find my own energy in, in the forest. In the old days, we used to do all our education ourselves. We used to teach our kids at home. We used to sort of, we used to believe in it. But we found that primary education was quite easy. You know, can teach kids to read and to write and that sort of stuff. It's quite easy. It, it's secondary education that's more difficult. So in the end, we gave the kids a choice of whether they wanted to go to school or not. And the, 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 gradually, a kid started wanting to go to school. And now, nearly all our kids go to school. I think at, at the moment, all the ones of school age do go to school. Bye. This little lad here is my, my grandson. Bye. His name is Jet. And uh, my boys, my sons were born in the valley and, and he was as well. So we've got three generations of this. And that's, that's lovely. So I see a lot of him. And it's a great pleasure being a granddad, I love it. Every year since I've been here, since I first came, I've drawn a little map of, uh, of the valley with uh, all the dwellings in it. I did it because I couldn't help it really, it's instinctive. It's a bit like, because uh, my profession is a, is, a, is a priest, a vicar, and the one, one thing the priest has always done in the, in the parish is keep the parish records. That's a daily mirror. Wigwam hippies told you know. And that's, oh, there's, there, there's me. This is uh, the independent. That's my partner, Kim, and that's Kai when he was a baby. And that's me putting the kettle on in my teepee.
prefer to be living in a roundhouse than living in this. I got forced to live in this by the planning laws. I mean, this is a square box. <laughs> I come from living in a teepee, you know. I, would have, I had plans to build a roundhouse out there in the field, have a garden round, a orchard round that, and this and that. If I was 20 years younger, 15 years younger, I'd probably, you know, but now I go, well, you know, is it ever going to get done? Maybe not. You know, maybe it's not what I want. I'll never reach the promised land. Uh, just in terms of a nice space, a circular space, windows all round, have a view, light coming in, environment, well insulated. It was so much easier and better to live like that. We've got it quite cushy here. We've got a very lovely round um, If I could move TP Valley to somewhere a little bit warmer and drier, I certainly would. Um, but it's here and it's lush and it rains a bit, but it's sunny too. Yeah. And I think again, it's generally a, a perspective. Do I focus on all the rain or do I focus on when it's sunny? So a single mother in a year or TP is difficult. One of my friends is living it down the bottom. Um, it's hard work, you're cutting wood, you're keeping the fire going, you're taking care of everything, washing up outside for a lot of people, they choose to wash up outside, we don't, <laughs> but, and it is a hard life, it's, a, it's more work, but for a couple, um, I would say there's a balance because we don't have to work as much, so there's actually more family time because we're both at home a bit more. I'm now a yoga teacher and a massage therapist and, uh, and a mum. I mean, my main job at the moment is being a mum. She's great. She's two and a bit, two and a half nearly actually, called Jaya. And she wasn't, we tried a home birth. The midwives for this area, for the valley, are fantastic. Um, totally supportive, no alienation, no, mm, can't cope with this, they were brilliant. And as, and as a mother, I love it. I love having this environment. I love having nature outside. I love being able to go and play in the stream with Jaya. As well, children being able to experience a bit of danger. I mean, for a kid to, I'm sure when you were young and when children in the 60s, 70s, even in the 80s, we'd all go out and play, we'd climb trees, we'd play, with stre we'd play in streams. Whereas growing up in the city, children. Well, go and ask Daddy if he can do it, yeah? Well done. Daddy, can we We generally, um, yeah, generally children don't have access to a natural amount of, of, of risk, which is healthy for growing up. But also, we don't have phone signals here, so we can't sit around chatting whilst looking at Facebook, whilst texting each other. When we're hanging out with our friends and our family, we're actually with our friends and our family. We've seen it change over the, uh, the, to start with it was purely nomadic dwellings in teepees and then it's, uh, it, yurts came in and now we've got these round houses, these huts which are more permanent and we have to be really clear with people what this means and that uh, when that uh, doesn't make you a, a freeholder because you've got your hut, that hut belongs to the land not to you, you might have created it, you might have put a thousand hours of work into creating it, you can't sell it, the land owns itself how we prefer to see it, the land owns itself, and owns us as well.
but everybody is is equal, equal in opportunity and equal in in rights. So far, it's brilliant, and we're very, very lucky and all very privileged indeed to have the opportunity to do it. If you respect the planet, the Earth, it's going to lead you to, to be following a certain kind of lifestyle, or it's going, it's going to lead you to reform your lifestyle to being more gentle on the Earth, which is what we all do here, we all try to do here. We see something happening in our immediate environment or in our not so immediate environment that is simply not good and not helping people or this planet. We need to do something about it. We need to say, excuse me, actually, I don't think I want to be a part of that anymore. And for me, living this way, it's part of me saying, do you know what, actually, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I mean, we still aren't great. We're not perfect. We're far from perfect here because we've still got a throwaway disposable society to to buy things from. I shop on eBay, you know. I'm not going to pretend that I'm a complete green, hip, green hippie that does it all perfectly green. But it's definitely, if everybody could live a bit more simply, we might have a chance of having a planet to live on 50 years from now. Whereas the rate we're going, I don't really know what sort of future Jai's going to have. Although, hopefully, she'll have a bit more, she'll have skills to cope with whatever it'll be more than someone maybe that grows up in the city. I suppose it's simple, really, in a way. It's back to the basic thing of man's relationship with the Earth. Because everything depends on man. Man's survival, the Earth's survival, everything depend all the animals we share this planet with all the species we share this planet with that have each or equal right to be here as we have an equal right to the space they need as we have that's a huge responsibility it's a huge task uh, everything else is froth man's folly the blind leading the blind they fall in at each now, it's not easy, but, you know, that's the task in a way for man. How does he live on this planet sustainably? You know, we've got all the tools and, and we've got the ability to do it. It's just whether we build or not. Oh, I'm more thinking about now and what I'm going to do tomorrow and next week and you know what I'm going to do with my life there rather than thinking too much about what happened years ago uh, yeah I think I'm more looking forward than back which is fortunate <laughs> uh, my age <clears throat>